The JBL Bar 1300 and 1300X are arguably one of the most versatile soundbars I've ever come across. Now they boast an 11.1.4 channel configuration, support for true Dolby Atmos, DTSX and also multi-beam surround sound and have also got detachable speakers. Now at the time of filming and in the UK, the Bar 1300 can be found for £1,300, while across the pond, in other words in the US, the Bar 1300X can be found for $1,700. Now it's worth pointing out over here that I could not find the Bar 1300 in the US and vice versa, could not find the 1300X in Europe nor in the UK. Now in case you're wondering the differences between the two, the 1300 has got a 10 inch subwoofer while the 1300X has got a 12 inch woofer instead. Despite that fact, both soundbars have got a claimed wattage of 1170 watts. So I'm not really sure what's going on there, but I can only go based on what the manufacturer has actually shared. Now, nonetheless, in this review, I'll be talking about both of the soundbars and the one on review is the 1300 as I'm based in the UK, and I'm gonna be comparing it to some of its rivals and fundamentally to see if they're actually worth their price tags. So to kick off this review, I would like to talk about its aesthetics, and here subjectively I've got no issues whatsoever. In fact, I would like to commend JBL for improving the overall design because it's got a nice and sleek and stylish look to it. Better still, it's got a sort of gunmetal finish which I think will work in most sorts of setups, and in my case I've got a 55 inch TV, and therefore even with the detachable speakers attached to the main soundbar unit, it still actually fits on my cabinet. Of course, you can remove the detachable speakers, which is very much recommended, and here you will find some small little magnetic clasps that fit onto the main unit. Now this is actually very handy and very much something that you want to do because it will protect the speaker from being damaged. At the side, you have got sideward firing drivers, and therefore, in case anyone's gonna be accidentally poking around, or of course, if you have got pets, then you'll want to make sure that you're protecting the soundbar. Aside from that, the soundbar itself can be wall mounted, and yes, that also includes the detachable speakers. Now, aside from this, you might have noticed there are a few physical buttons positioned at the top of the soundbar, and indeed, these are greatly appreciated over touch or capacitive buttons that some of the rivals actually opt for. Better still, you have got a forward facing display that gives you an indication of the settings that you're adjusting, and even the metadata that's being fed through to the soundbar. You have of course got a bundled remote that provides you all the sorts of information that you need and also all the controls that you can adjust from afar. Now as an extension to the physical remote you have also got a virtual one and here you can access it via the JBL One app, certainly appreciated if you lose the former. Now here you'll be able also to adjust the volume on the fly, see what's playing and also add the in-app music services. They're quite limited but nonetheless should be appreciated by most consumers. You have also got a three band EQ, where you can see in terms of my settings, I've added quite a few notches to treble and taken quite a few off bass. This is all very subjective and I'll be touching upon why I added this EQ further than this video. But in this section, I would like to cover the fact that if you were to disable it, unlike previous iterations of JBL soundbars, it does actually remember your last used mode. But unfortunately, there's still no profile that you can save to. Now as for the moments, you can set them up if you so wish. It's not something that I utilize myself, but it's great to see that degree of customization. As for the detachable speakers, you can adjust their levels. In most cases, I use it in terms of maximum, and you can also adjust the audio sync delay. Now finally, in terms of the calibration, this is certainly something that I would recommend doing as soon as you set up the soundbar. After doing the firmware updates, do the audio calibration in order to get the best sort of audio reproduction, as it will scan for objects around your room and optimize the soundbar to the best of its degree. And yes, you can use it on top of the equalizer as I did. Now finally, you've got the product settings where you can look at the Wi-Fi and also adjust the Chromecast, Alexa and Spotify Connect settings. Now for you to connect up to the app, there must be some sort of support for wireless transmission technology. And indeed there is. First off, you have got Bluetooth, where the version 5.0 is utilized and the SBC codec is used only, which is quite disappointing and also a little bit baffling, and I'll touch upon why very shortly. Now thankfully, you have got dual band Wi-Fi support, therefore meaning that setting it up on a mesh network or any sort of network that you might have will not be an issue. And yes, the same couldn't be said about some of its competitors, for example, from the likes of Sonos. 
Now here, this means that you can enable a bunch of different music streaming services, as I did showcase via the app section, and you've also got the built-in Chromecast, Amazon Alexa Multiroom, and also Apple AirPlay, all of which are certainly appreciated and adds to the overall versatility of the soundbar. Now aside from this, you have of course got wired connectivity, and here it has its pros and cons. On one hand, I love the fact that it has got optical for more legacy devices, and you've also got HDMI eARC. And yes indeed, it is backwards compatible, so therefore if you have an older television running the ARC standard, it will be supported on this soundbar. So it doesn't matter which sort of make, model, or indeed year your TV was made. Now past that, my actual disappointment is the actual three HDMI inputs. Now they do support 4K, HDR10 and Dolby Vision pass-through, but unfortunately, due to them not actually having the full bandwidth 2.1 standard, it means that you cannot feed through VRR 4K 120Hz. Therefore, will be of disappointment to modern console gamers, but will be a non-issue for video files which are connecting up their Blu-ray players or of course their setup boxes. Now I would also like to mention that in the US, the Bar 1300X has also got USB playback, but unfortunately in Europe and in the UK, the USB port is only used for charging. Now while I've got my reservations about the HDMI inputs, I absolutely love the fact that JBL have incorporated Bluetooth directly into the detachable speakers. Now this means that you can of course pair up to the main soundbar unit over Bluetooth or detach the speakers and connect to them directly be it in a mono or a stereo format. Now given the speakers are rated each at 110 watts, you've got a whopping amount of sound and it certainly is very impressive. Now you have got a total battery life of 12 hours, at least according to the manufacturer, and from my own test it seemed to match up to expectations. You have got a USB Type-C port to charge them, and it takes roughly 4 hours to charge the speakers when they're docked into the main soundbar unit. Suffice to say over here, the Bluetooth speakers, or should I say the detachable speakers, can be used in, let's say, the kitchen, the garden, or even be taken to a friend's house. Therefore, meaning that you've got a great sort of versatility, and I'd love to see more manufacturers actually integrate this. Now, what I did say was a little bit odd about the Bluetooth codecs is because if you pair up to the detachable speakers, you have got access to Bluetooth 5.2, and that is, of course, backwards compatible if you've got an older device, and you have got the SBC and the AAC codecs. Now, it's really odd to see a slightly different configuration from the main soundbar unit, and it's odd that JBL haven't just incorporated Bluetooth 5.2 in the main soundbar unit and also the AAC codec, but nonetheless, this will certainly be appreciated for iOS users, specifically those, for example, on iPhone, because the AAC codec is going to be preferred. Even for us Android users, in other words, myself, I would still be able to benefit from better audio fidelity because the AAC codec is using a better sort of compression in comparison to the SBC codec. Ultimately, over here, you're getting better audio fidelity while you're using the detachable speakers rather than when you're using the main soundbar unit, which is baffling to say the least. So with all that out of the way, let me get on to an audio demo. Now I appreciate it's not going to be ideal over YouTube, specifically not using my microphones, but it'll give you a little bit of a taster as to what to expect, and give you a bit of a background as to what I'm going to be talking about in the subjective part of this review. Now in this respect, I'll be using Priya J's track that is titled Like Me, and then I'll be using a piece to camera, where I'll be presenting the Hyundai Ioniq 6 on Totally EV. Do bear in mind the annotations on your screen because I will also be toggling on and off the pure voice dialogue technology. kilowatt hour to be more specific and also it has a heat pump that comes fitted as standard which is certainly appreciated. 
Now, the manufacturer claims that you will get between 320 to 340 miles on the WLTP test cycle. However, from my own mixed driving test, I netted 250 to 270 miles, which is actually a very impressive score in comparison to some of its competitors. It's actually only beaten by the likes of the Tesla Model 3 Long Range, which actually netted 310 miles. So let me try and paint a little bit of a better picture over here. The BMW i4 M50 and the likes of the Polestar 2 all-wheel drive without a heat pump. So moving past the audio demos, I would like to touch upon its speaker configuration. And here, the main soundbar unit has got six 46 by 90 millimeter racetrack drivers, five 20 millimeter tweeters, and four 70 millimeter upward firing full range drivers. The total power output is rated at 650 watts, at least according to the manufacturer. Now, as for the surround speakers, each of them are rated at 110 watts each, tallying up to 220 watts in total. Now, each speaker has got a singular 46 by 90 millimeter racetrack driver, a singular 20 millimeter tweeter, and a singular 70 millimeter upward firing full range driver. You then also have got two 48 by 69 millimeter rounded rectangular passive radiators. Now, finally, you have, of course, got the subwoofer, which is rated at 300 watts. This is a 10 inch driver in the Europe and UK. And as far as I can tell, in the US, you have got the same power output, but a 12 inch driver instead. As for the frequency response of the system, be it with the 1300 or the 1300X, it is rated at 33Hz up to 20kHz. Now I appreciate that as a lot of specs to take in, so let me get on to my subjective opinion. Now first off, I would like to talk upon the different sound modes. First off, you've got the pure voice technology, which I did enable and disable on my piece to camera while presenting the Ionic 6. And what I'll say is that with the technology enabled, the vocals came out to the foreground. In fact, when I was listening to music, I actually have this enabled at all times. Speaking of which, the technology gets enabled every single time you power on the soundbar, even if you had previously disabled it, which can be slightly cumbersome for those people who don't want to enable it for some given reason. On that note, you've also got a smart mode, which is somewhat similar to what Samsung, its parent company, actually offers. Now, smart mode, yet again, also gets enabled each time you power on the soundbar, even if you had disabled it before. Now, I saw across certain forums that some people suggested disabling smart mode in order to get a bit more forward sounding mids. But from my own experience, I felt that smart mode was best left enabled. So therefore, you can potentially see why JBL have permanently enabled both technologies because subjectively, they do actually benefit the overall sound quality that these soundbars are able to reproduce. Now, with those two technologies enabled, I went ahead and did my critical listening tests. And first off, I have to talk about that sub bass rumble. Now, yes, it's a JBL system. It has a wireless subwoofer, and in this respect, a 10 inch driver, and no surprise over here, that it does actually rock your room. Now, in my case, I actually had to reduce the bass by one notch. In other words, it's got five different levels for you to choose from, and I chose level two, which is one down from the default of level three. Going up to level five with my living room door closed, it actually did make my door rumble, which is actually quite fun, but not something appreciated, be it from my neighbors or my other half. Now in this respect, the sub bass response is certainly heard and can be felt. The quantity and quality are there, and given the larger 10 inch woofer, it means that you're gonna get the low end prowess. However, it does cut off at around 33 Hz, and as a result means that it can't quite compete with some more premium systems out there. For example, one that comes to mind is the dedicated subwoofer system from Sennheiser, which extends all the way down to 27 Hz, therefore giving you a far better quality at the low end. So therefore, if your bass rumble is definitely gonna be one of your top priorities, you might want to look at a dedicated system or indeed a hi-fi system instead that has a more competent subwoofer. Still, for a system, or in other words, a soundbar which has a subwoofer included, the JBL one is certainly one of my favorites. Now the same could be said about its mid-bass response. It's very punchy and hearty. Now you can EQ it as I did showcase via the app, and in this respect I felt that actually the default EQ for the bass was actually done pretty well. I had no issues whatsoever when it came to listening back to my favorite R&B, DMB, or EDM tracks, or even including when I was listening to, let's say, piece to cameras, for example, when I was watching back my video while I was presenting the Ionic 6. 
Frankly, over here, the mid bass is done to perfection, and I've got no complaints whatsoever. Now, with all that low end prowess, it's no surprise to learn that the mid range is actually affected, specifically the lower mids. Now, in this respect, it can't quite compete with flagship offerings from the likes of Sonos, Bose, Sennheiser, and to a degree its sibling Samsung, but it's not too bad in the grander scheme of things. It's just that some of its competitors will give you better vocal clarity. Now, I would also like to highlight that you can EQ it through the app, but by doing so, you might actually take away from the overall accuracy, and you might actually add a little bit of an odd reverb, therefore meaning that it will take away from what you might expect, for example, from a set of reference bookshelf speakers or hi-fi speakers. As such, I pretty much left the mid EQ pretty much untouched. Now, I would also like to highlight that in my experience, I felt that the soundbar did benefit from using the detachable speakers. Now, not only in terms of its overall soundstage, which I'll be touching upon very shortly, but also in terms of its overall mid-range clarity. See, initially, when I set up the soundbar, I plugged in the speakers in order to charge them, and after a little bit of while, I turned on the soundbar and was left immediately disheartened. Yes, even including with a little bit of EQ. Now, this was actually because I felt that the overall vocals were being pushed back so much that in sort of action films or even, for example, in a music demo, that the vocals were being just put down to the background rather than to the foreground as they should be on a very expensive soundbar. Now, that all changed as soon as I unplugged the detachable speakers. Doing so meant that the vocal tracks seemed to come out more to the foreground and the soundbar suddenly had a lot more life to it. Now, I'm not really sure if that's because the detachable speakers were positioned relatively close to me and therefore I was getting vocal tracks a little bit closer to my ears. Or it could be also the fact that the singular speaker that is positioned on either side of the main soundbar unit was being otherwise covered up by the detachable speakers. I'm not really sure if this speaker gets disabled when the detachable speakers are plugged in, but suffice to say, you've got some material to handle over here. And of course, in this respect, in pure physics point of view, then the speaker can't really able to reproduce to its best degree. As a result, I just felt that for me to get the best out of the soundbar, I would have to use the detachable speakers, which really was not a negative point because if I was looking at the JBL bar 1300 or 1300X, I would certainly want to utilize that factor because it's arguably one of its key selling points. Now, as for the highs, they extend extremely well at the top end. I had absolutely no problems whatsoever, be it in terms of listening to more challenging audio tracks or indeed listening to movies. Here, because of the plethora of tweeters that's positioned within the main soundbar unit and even on the detachable speakers, it meant I had that sort of toe tapping feeling without that sort of harshness or sibilance. Now, I did EQ it pretty harshly in terms of the app, but suffice to say, that is all very subjective. So make sure you play around with it, specifically if you get that soundbar, for you to get the best sort of high-end extension to your liking. Now, very much leading on from that point, I would like to talk about its overall soundstage reproduction. And here, I was actually left very impressed. But for me to get onto my subjective opinion, I think it's be quite fitting to give you another audio demo. In this respect, I'll be using a movie, which is Transformers Age of Extinctions. And in this respect, I'll be not only using the soundbar with Dolby Digital Surround and also Dolby Atmos, but then I'll also be playing Dolby Atmos with the main soundbar unit and also the main soundbar unit with detachable speakers positioned behind the microphone. Make sure you check out the annotations on your screen to understand how it's actually being portrayed.
thing, sir. You know it. What do you mean? What thing? What we're about to do is going to be kind of scary. Pick out your guns and shoot them. Now yet again an audio demo over YouTube is not going to be ideal, specifically when it comes to demonstrating the benefits of Dolby Atmos or DTSX. Indeed the heightened metadata really do take this soundbar to another dimension. You get gunshots coming from left and right, the vocal tracks coming to the foreground and also let's say helicopters flying above you. At least in that Transformers little clip I just felt that I was far more engaged with the content that I was consuming while using Dolby Atmos in comparison to let's say Dolby Surround. Round. Frankly here it's no competition and if you've got the ability to benefit from the heightened metadata such as Dolby Atmos or DTSX then you're going to feel really engaged with the soundbar. Now it's not to say that if you do not have access to these metadata or simply don't care about them that you're not going to get a really room filling sound. Far from it. Actually here while using it with Dolby Digital for example on terrestrial HD television or even on PCM while watching YouTube or regular terrestrial television I still felt really engaged. See here with the surround speakers there has some sort of up mixing technology and therefore my room was still filled with sound and one that gave me a good sort of positional cues and great width and depth. Frankly over here in terms of the overall soundstage I think it's among one of the best soundbars that I've reviewed and therefore means that if you want to get that sort of cinematic feel in a soundbar of course then you're going to be left very impressed with a JBL bar 1300 or 1300X. So with all that in mind it brings me on to my verdict and quite frankly when I first unboxed this soundbar I was left quite disheartened. However with time it really grew on me. From the versatility of detachable speakers, be it in terms of using them over a Bluetooth speaker or of course using them to give me a better surround sound feel, to the connectivity options specifically over wireless and the customization via the app and of course it goes without saying that the overall sound quality of this soundbar is phenomenal. Now granted it's not quite perfect. The emission of HDMI 2.1 is definitely disappointing, the fact that the subwoofer doesn't extend as low as some standalone units and also the fact that the main soundbar unit does not have better support for Bluetooth. Still with all the things considered it is competitively priced and I can still see myself actively recommending it. As such it gets my best buy awards. Now I'd be curious to know what you make of it down in the comments section below and how you would compare it with other soundbars out there on the market. Would you pick it? Yes or no? Do let me know. Now of course if you've liked this independent detail review and want to see more from myself definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification. All of which would be greatly appreciated. As such I've been totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.